Three years ago, I gave a TEDx presentation here at Valparaiso University. And I nailed that talk <laughs> at the rehearsal <laughs> that morning. <laughs> I get the five minutes before I was supposed to get on stage, I had a full-blown panic attack, like nothing I've ever seen or felt before in my whole life. And I have been teaching in higher ed for over 20 years. It, it hit me with such force that I, my heart was as if it was in my head and it was hammering in my ears. I couldn't hear anything. Everything was fuzzy. If you had asked me my children's names, I don't think I could have come up with them, let alone the content of my talk. I was so terrified, and then finally the student said, you need to get on stage, and I did give the talk. But I wondered for three years, what made my behavior switch? What made me feel as if I was running into a bear in the woods? That's how bad it was, how terrified I was. And I was so afraid that I was not going to be Brene Brown or Amy Cuddy or Susan Cain. And guess what? Impossible! I cannot be those women. I can only be myself. And I think back then that if I had relied on my sense of humor, I would have seen the absurdity of my thinking. I would have seen that there is no death threat in this red circle. That was... <laughs> so when I think about laughter, Laughter fosters awareness, connection, resilience, and positive change. I like to think that I'm an example of resilience because I've put myself through this again by being here tonight. <laughs> the reason I was so petrified is a thing called survival. We have three basic human needs. They are safety, belonging, and dignity. And the three basic responses, for just a general overview, are fight, flight, and freeze. There's also disassociation. So a few years ago, my husband, Tim, and I were riding our road bikes out on the back roads of Indiana. And I was pedaling along, admiring the cows and the corn, when all of a sudden I heard a screech. And I looked over my shoulder, and my husband was pedaling furiously to escape a car that was coming straight at him and eventually crashed into a tree. Tim and I got on our bikes, off our bikes, completely shaken. Miraculously, we watched the driver come out of the car. If I had been Tim, I would hit the brakes, and I wouldn't be here to give this talk. I'm a freezer. Moreover, I'm a freezer pleaser, or was, until I learned that it no longer served me. I had all my needs met by being a freezer pleaser. It worked for me. I had a lot of friends when I was young. I had a sense of belonging and dignity because people liked me. I had a sense of safety because I felt like I had a community that liked to hang around with me. There's a major consequence to this pleasing thing, and it's called the sense of self. In her new book, The Way of Integrity, Martha, Martha Beck calls it the hustle. Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith in their book, How Women Rise, call it the disease to please. I knew that I had to change. I knew I had to change when I had small children, and at one point I said to them in the kitchen, nobody is allowed to ask me something that I have to say no to. It was not a, t a strategy for parenting. If I had relied on humor, I think I would have not had my panic attack, and I look back on some of the parenting mishaps that I had. If I had relied on my sense of humor, I think that it, I would have saved us a lot of grief. In their book, Lighten Up, Lighten Up Survival Skills for People Under Pressure, C.W. Metcalf and Roma Fellable identify three basic humor skills. The first one is to take yourself lightly while taking your work seriously. I was taking myself far too seriously when it came to delivering that TEDx talk three years ago. I acted as if it defined me and who I was. I also acted like it was going to change my future or change my life. It was absolutely absurd. And that's related to their second skill. 
The second skill is see, to see the absurdity in difficult situations and in much of human behavior. And that's an act of brilliance, to see the absurdity in the way that we behave at times. And the third is to take a real dis disciplined approach to the joy of being alive. So this talk is pretty much about humor and laughter. I believe that laughter creates awareness. When we can see and recognize our idiosyncratic behavior for what it is, we can rejoice in it, or we can choose to change. A couple months ago, I was out walking with my friend Peg, and I said, you know, I got to put something in the garbage. So I stepped aside to put it in the garbage, and I looked back, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I have to walk continuously for 60 minutes for this to count. And I said, okay. <laughs> we have all kinds of compulsiveness, right? We have things that we do. I actually took my steps watch off <laughs> for this talk, but I typically, I'm checking. We have behaviors that we do and that we're not aware of. And when other people point them out to us or we become aware of them, we can just really rejoice in how funny people really are. Laughter also uh, fosters connection. We're 30 times more likely to laugh with somebody else than we are by ourselves. Think about the bonds you've created with people when you've had those doubled over laughs. We're gut wrenching, doubled over, rolling off the couch kind of laughter. Chances are you were in an inappropriate place like church or somewhere else. I have some of those or rehearsing for high school plays backstage when I was when we weren't supposed to be talking. Those were the worst. It's joy that we take and we build that connection. When I was in high school, the rock band Queen came out with this tremendous hit. And I decided to sing it at the top of my lungs. We are the trap guns. We are the trap guns. No time for losers. My friends were like, we are the what? <laughs> And I said, the trap guns? <laughs> we still laugh over that. We laugh, and it's 45 years ago. With a, the bonds created from that, I will forever be connected in, in that spot, in that kitchen, to those friends of mine growing up. I believe we need to create more safe spaces to metaphorically sing the wrong lyrics. We need to rejoice in the fact that we make errors. We need to think... Let me tell you, I goofed this up, and I'm so glad I did it now because I learned for it, from it, so I won't do it tomorrow. I, or I won't do it when it's in a, a worse situation. We need to really, really enjoy the fact that we make errors because that's how we grow. This is my mother, a photograph of her. She's going to be 95 next month. And she hates having a photo, her photograph taken, hates cameras. And I said to her, Mom, come on, you got to take your picture. The kids want me to send them one. My kids love their grandma. So I hope you witness or feel inside you what I feel when I see this picture, joy. This is a sense of joy in this woman laughing. That's mirror neurons. We do this. We mirror emotions and behaviors that we witness with people we're with. So I wonder, what are people mirroring from you? Yuri Hassan, a, a Princeton psychologist, calls it brain-to-brain -brain coupling. L laughter is synchronous. So the National Institute of Health did a study on synchronous movement, and the studies show that people like people that they're doing things with. They like people when they're doing things synchronously with them. Think about, no wonder I like line dancing so much, right? Or sun salutations in a yoga class, or Tai Bo, or whatever it is that you do that you're able to do with others. I think of sports. Laughter is synchronous. We tend to enjoy people that we laugh with. We need more of it. Resilience, this is my granddaughter. And this is a power pose where it says, stay away pessimism and panic. Stay away cynicism. We have a choice. 
we can indeed build our resilience through laughter. One of our really good friends was in a terrible car accident a few years ago. In fact, he was run over by a Ferrari. Four men lifted the car off of him. An ambulance came, rushed him to the hospital. I went to visit Scott. They had put plates in his face to rebuild it. He was completely ensconced in contraptions to keep his body still. He had the halo over his head, completely hooked up. His wife stood at the end of the hospital bed and said to the nurses, the neck collar doesn't look straight. Scott replied, what time's the fashion show? <laughs> That's resilience. Scott now rides his mountain bike on a daily basis in Boise, Idaho. These kind of witticisms, quips, they lift us up. They do. We can help people carry their burdens by lifting, by seeing those moments of incongruity. It's, they happen all the time. We have to pay attention. If we're distracted, we're going to miss it. Whoops. Um, Henry Ward Beecher said, a person without a sense of humor is like a wagon without springs. It's jolted by every pebble in the road. Laughter helps us be more flexible, more fluid in the way that we think, the way that we act, right? It eases stress. Oops. Laughter also, whoops, fosters positive change. As I'm laughing that I goofed up my slides. We need to also see the absurdity and gloom and doom thinking and rigidity and narrow-mindedness. Laughter releases the stress of that and enables us to have more creativity and innovation. It's a fact that we come up with new ideas more when we're at ease than when we're in a state of fear. Last summer, I participated in a board retreat, and they put us in pairs in this Jeff, who I didn't know, and I were paired, and they put a rope around our wrists, and we were charged with getting out of the rope riddle without cutting it. So I went under, he went under, we spun around, we were back to back, I tried to go under one arm. We did not solve the riddle. We didn't win the race. But that afternoon, we generated some of the best ideas for that strategic plan that they've seen in a while. The role of laughter is that it connects us, it eases tension, and it opens us up to new possibilities and new ways of thinking. Laughter is healthy. It's good for you. You don't even have to get off the couch, and you'll increase your heart rate. You know, it, it lowers your blood pressure. It boosts the immune system. We got to laugh more, especially now during this pandemic. It also releases endorphins and dopamine into the brain, which are real good, feel-good hormones. And if you're lucky, you'll get some involuntary Kegel ex exercises while you're at it. <laughs> Laughter, though, and humor, there's a caveat. It doesn't heal heartache. I have heartache. I'm sure you have heartache. When I'm in the midst of it, I don't want you telling me funny jokes. And I don't want you distracting me with goofy stories. I want you to be with me. I want to feel, whoops, I did it again. Shoot. <laughs> I want you to feel that you're with me. I want you to be communicating. I'm with you. You're not going to fix it, right? There are places that words can't reach, to quote Hamilton. You know, it's quiet uptown. There is suffering that words can't reach. But being with me can. Your presence can. And then something really miraculous happens. I laugh when somebody is like that with me. I laugh, not a belly laugh, not a, not a doubled over laugh. I laugh a sense of relief. I, uh, it's a sense of somebody's helping me carry this burden. 
just for this short time. The beauty of laughter cannot be underestimated. We need more of it. We can help people lighten their loads. We can lighten up the world by practicing our humor skills, by increasing our awareness, our connection, building resilience, and fostering positive change. Be the light. Thank you.